Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to, or welcome back to, because so many of you are repeat listeners, here at the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thank you so much for coming along on the journey of this show that we have now been doing for over a year and a half. This podcast, it's designed to be a resource for those who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society, it is the forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product lifecycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have had the honor from the very first episode to co-host this episode, this show with Craig Brown. Now, Craig, he's an industry veteran and former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, Craig, how are you today? I'm good, Tom. It's good to hear your voice. I'm looking forward to our next podcast here. You know, it's always fun. It's every week. I look forward to uh, my, my 30 minutes, sometimes 35 or 38 <laughs> minutes. Uh, you know, it's that's all, when he's cutting us off. Are, that's exactly are, right. Are you saying I don't follow a timeline? You know, uh, never mind. <laughs> you know, Craig, if it wasn't so much fun, I'd cut you off at 30 minutes. But you're always asking our guests really, really smart questions. And I think today, today is going to be one of those days because every single week, Craig and I work hard to bring to the listeners of this show ideas and interviews that are going to help you enhance and grow your career. And today we have Dora Smith. Now, Dora is the Senior Director of the Global Academic Program at Siemens. And what that means is that she helps set the strategy for how they reach out to the academic market. Uh, they do things like university relations and reaching out to schools and also uh, working on sort of the, the competitions and stuff that they do that is really awesome. And we're going to learn a lot more of that today from Dora. So, Dora, welcome to the Digital Thank Enterprise for Society me. podcast. We're glad you're here. Thanks, Tom. Hey, so, Craig, good to hear your voice too. Yeah, likewise. So Dora, give us a little bit of background of, of how you started your career and what led you to where you are today at Siemens. Yeah, so I started my career um, in really technical marketing and uh, communications. Um, I say I have always served the same customer and user base, but just from different perspectives. So I started on the vendor side, what was then EDS Unigraphics. Um, and then after a couple of years, I got the opportunity to uh, run the user group organization. So mm -hmm. the predecessor of DES, the predecessor of PLM World, uh, was at that time called Unigraphics User Group. So I was finishing up uh, my master's in business then. So it was a great opportunity to go outside the company, run really a small business. Um, just great experience. It got to help us get nonprofit status so we could really invest in growing the organization tried to make it about something more than just the physical events a couple times a year. Um, and then from there, I remember the board hired me into their company, which really was a, a reseller partner of technology, but also in the training business. And they were at that time coming out with one of the first e-learning tools in our industry. So I got the chance to, to help mm -hmm. them stand that up, try to educate the market on what e-learning was, build out an academic program, worked on certification programs. And then I came back full circle uh, to the vendor side just before Siemens had acquired us and um, several different roles back here at, at the home base, uh, but eventually landed in our partner strategy team and then was asked to take over uh, leading our academic program about six years ago. So yeah, a journey. So Dora, you and I got to interact about that six years ago because the company I work for and Siemens, we, we did a lot of things with student competitions. That was part of our academic engagement. So. I, f I remember those conversations partly because we were at my alma mater, and at that time you interviewed me. <laughs> and, yeah, and it I'm was usually on the other side of this. Yeah, right. So, so all those things you did, I get to do back now. But well, and, um, and you the said truth is also, it, it, Dora, you said that you have a podcast also, right? So this is this isn't your first show. Yeah. No, I, I started some of the social media work at our company. So I used to interview um, Chuck Grindstaff, our CEO, in a podcast. Right now, we have an academic podcast called Innovation in the Classroom. So, yeah. See, there's already one difference. I'm not taking my voice out. It was so it was so much fun. Um, um, Dora and her team, they recorded several of us during this event in Cincinnati a few years ago. And then they did a wonderful job editing it into a story about 
how we have to help universities, we industries, whether it's uh, people building products like a General Motors or people like Siemens Digital Industries building the tools that help build the products, right? So uh, I have a very fond memory of that and I'm not near as good at editing, just so you know. So we're, we're more informal, um, but um, it, it's thank, I'm, I'm glad you're continuing it. I, I, I uh, you know, as I entered retirement, you, you kind of hope the things that you contribute to are, are still used by the people you worked with. And what you guys are doing at Siemens is, is impressive and it, it, it's your show now. So I, I just wanted to say hats off and thanks so much for, for engaging students. I, I think one of the, things I've noticed over the years is, is, you know, a lot of students come out with their basic skills, uh, basic engineering skills, but there's a set of skills that they don't have, right? And um, one of the people that was in one of the reports you sent me is, is a guy named Harvey Bell. And, and Harvey was a, a very uh, dynamic leader at General Motors. A lot of us worked with Harvey. And Harvey and I have talked over the years since he retired, which is about a decade before I retired, and, and it was just this whole point about, well, the universities aren't building uh, talent the way we need it for the industry. So, um, you know, interesting enough, Craig, Harvey um, is quoted in a, a new ebook we have coming out, um, mm -hmm. or we just had come out through Tech Clarity, and we can get to it later, but he talks about the pandemic because he retired, but then he went into academia, right? So he took right. his industry knowledge to academic, which is fantastic. And he talks about the pandemic giving the first chance for students to really experience what a global design review would be like, right? You no longer are physically in Oh, because you're place. not in the same room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's and, a forced uh, opportunity there. So so we'll come back to COVID before we get done. <laughs> but but the basic skills gap in the last six years, the, the six years you've you've been in this role, have you seen this start to close? And, and if it is closing, what what is it that's making it happen? Because it still seemed to be a problem to me. We, we'd get new graduates and we'd still have to send them through rotational assignments to get them the skills they need to work inside a corporation. So is, this, is the yeah. gap closing? It's improving in some places. Um, and I can actually give you some, some recent stats because one of my other hats is I'm on the corporate member council for ASEE, the American Society of Engineering Education. And we just did a I'll call it the voice of the um, student or fresh hire, because a lot of the skills gap studies are what we as industry think um, mm. or what academic thinks. Let's hear directly from the people who've been hired in well, the last that, five years. That's and, refreshing. We should ask yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that's good. So what was interesting is that it's the things that have improved, um, and this was based, uh, there was a study done through an NSF funded activity with ASE, you know, five years ago. So we used a similar knowledge, skills, and abilities methodology they tested. So 93% feeling prepared um, with curiosity and desire for continuous learning. So that's okay. huge because that's like the number one thing we need now is to really make sure future engineers are ready to keep on learning. Um, well, and what's interesting, Tom, what's the number one thing we hear about when we ask people for advice? They always bring up curiosity. Curiosity and mentors are the two biggest things we so, hear about. So that's cool that the kids yeah. know, the youngsters know. Sorry, everybody that's really young. Um, <laughs> the youngsters know they need to stay curious. That's cool. That's excellent. Yeah. Another area that we saw improvement was nearly 60% feeling very prepared in communication skills, um, emotional mm -hmm. intelligence, and multidisciplinary teamwork, which you'll remember is one of the key tenets of mm -hmm. what we were pushing through some of that competition work. Um, on the not so good, 60% not prepared in critical thinking, that continues to be wow. an issue. How can you be a scientist and not be a critical thinker? But never mind. Because <laughs> I, I think we don't put them enough in the situations to do that. It'll come back to well, that real world point. application, real world problem solving. Um, the other one that particularly in this climate we're in right now that uh, worries me was 58% uh, not feeling prepared in cultural awareness, ethics, and social responsibility. So that's a big one that we have to work on. And I think there's an opportunity there. Do, do, do you... Okay, so you you did the interview. Do you have an analysis as to why or, or maybe what we should do about it? Um, not, well, okay, in the study that it doesn't cover that, right? That's right. just the student's feedback. Um, but when we look at some of the grand challenges and some of just the larger planet societal issues we have, I think mm -hmm. this is what students actually care to work on, right? There certainly are some that are going to continue to be passionate about automotive or aerospace, but they want to make a difference in their community and ideally something that even goes beyond their community. 
And so I think we now have the opportunity, we didn't have it years ago, Craig, of having these online platforms that could really bring together a global group of students to collaborate on a problem. Right. Um, so I think we have the means um, and I think we have the challenges, frankly, in our world today, uh, one we've all experienced the last nine months, that um, we've got a way to really bring them together and, and give them an opportunity to improve there. Um, and the other two other things I'll touch on from that study was okay. most not prepared, prepared in any of the emerging technologies. So 85% not prepared for AR or digital twin or AI. Um, and there's a lot of work that happens in those spaces in schools, but it's often on the research side of the house and not embedded in the, the curriculum. Well, yeah, and, then, and, and maybe some of those students, in fact, are gamers. And so they're interacting with virtual reality and AI all the time. They just may not appreciate it, right? <clears throat> yeah, they don't get a chance to do it in the context of how right. they would actually use it in the workforce, right? Right. Um, and then there was a lot of areas like that were just 50-50. So have, we haven't moved the needle there, right? 50 might feel prepared, 50% feeling not prepared. And one big one was project management. So hmm. that one should be a pretty easy one we should be able to solve through a lot of these, these competition and other capstone projects. Interesting. So, so, so I, 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 I kind of want to be the jury and, and get, you know, like any engineer, dive into the what's the root cause. But, but part of this is, is how educators, uh, be it the projects or be it professors, how educators go about, um, you know, teaching, right? And, and so is this... Um, are, are the things in place to, to enable the future of engineering education? I mean, I mean, you're right, technology's here. The, 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 the technology we're using today, right? We're in three different parts of the country. We, we have been since the pandemic started. And, and um, I just wonder, are, you know, how's education um, addressing these gaps? Is it, is it just the university or is it more than the universities? Um, it's definitely more than the universities and we okay. can, talk all about kind of where we're trying to meet learners where they're at, and it may not be in that traditional university setting. Mm -hmm. um, but we have seen, and, and somewhat, you, some folks say, you know, don't let a good pandemic go to waste, a real change. <laughs> oh, okay, the, that's good. I, I had, that, I that's hadn't the heard, first time I've heard a positive about it. <laughs> I hadn't heard that, but, but keep going. Uh, actually, the podcast I just recorded last week, you guys will hear it when it when it gets published. Uh, uh, my interview, he was, uh, said that. So, um, there are some great things happening at schools. You know, they had to embrace digitalization, right? And you saw what may have taken them years. They really had to come together in, in a couple months. Um, so there seems to be a little bit more of a willingness there. It, it's easier in some countries than others, right? Uh, there's some countries that from the federal government down are funding all of education and they can force change. Um, I'll tell you in China, they are making now anyone who comes into the vocational setting as an educator has to have worked in industry at least five years, I believe. And well, then every, good. yeah, and then every fifth year they go back and work a year. Um, and so we've started to see some educators warm up to let's do reverse sabbaticals. Let's come back into industry and, and continue to upskill um, themselves. So I, I think we, we see some good things happen there. there. They're just frankly, from a pipeline standpoint, it, it's not enough. We still need a lot more from vocational schools. We need even the non-traditional um, uh, learners that we can reach through, you know, MOOCs and other open platforms uh, mm -hmm. to really fill the, the full pipeline we need and our customers need. Okay, so the pandemic helped go virtual, meaning work remotely from each other. Are there other innovations in the classroom that, that could help, um, you know, especially maybe things that you guys at Siemens are encouraging? Encouraging and, and yeah, part of, so some of the things we've been investing a lot in our curriculum uh, certification and, and training. And so on the curriculum side, looking at curriculum that can help educators cross disciplines. Um, we just were working with a dean um, last week, talking through an Industry 4.0 mechatronics program that they're going to put in mm -hmm. place. And you see some of that mechatronics at a technician level in, in vocational schools, not necessarily as a full undergraduate uh, curriculum. So that is really, you know, a lighthouse example of what we see happening. Um, and then we also see, Craig, outside of the engineering, right? We need our business leaders of the future to really understand digitalization in the space. So well, looking yeah. at PLM, um, we have a course called the business value of PLM, right? And taking that to business schools so we can, mm -hmm. they don't need to touch all the tools, but they need to understand the impact they can have on, on their businesses. Right. So trying to expand that scope. Um, and then some other things we've certainly seen uh, a lot in virtual lab space because it's just had to happen over the last nine months. So, so this is this is probably ancient news now, but 
Um, the first time I visited Purdue in, in my PLM role, so that's over a decade ago, um, um, we had an interesting discussion. I, I was invited to a luncheon with, with our sponsor, um, who a lot of us know, it's, it's Dr. Hartman, but also with other deans from the other colleges, right, or, or the other departments. And, and it was interesting, the discussion at lunch led to, to well, how much electronics or electrical does a mechanical engineer need to know, or how much chemistry does, you know, so we were getting to the discussion about cross-discipline knowledge. I was uh, frankly disappointed at nobody in the room other than Dr. Hartman saying, we got to figure out how to bridge these silos. Do, do you see the academia is finally bridging their silos? I mean, it, part of it's the way they, they get funded, part of it's other things. I, I know Harvey and, and others, we've all been preaching, no, it's systems engineering. You, you've got to figure out how to bridge the silos. Is, I, I sense that the universities were part of the problem. Are they now part of the solution? Uh, maybe it's back to that stat I gave about the 50-50 on the- Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a there's safe some, answer. <laughs> there's some doing some really great work, Craig. Sometimes they're standing up brand new programs because that's frankly easier, mm -hmm. right? Than trying to, to really yeah. change the other curriculum. It's like, it's like starting a new company, right? Sometimes yeah. it's easier than changing, right? Sadly. And some schools are doing these projects that have to integrate across disciplines. So they will have projects that are electrical, mechanical, and software. And, in, and to my point about business, bringing in business schools as well. So you have this kind of full, well-rounded group of students uh, coming together. Um, you know, PLM is one side of our house, and we're also on the EDA side, right? And so mm -hmm. we've seen on the EDA side, schools really try to address, there aren't these kind of separate circuit designers and circuit board designers, right? You now will need to be a designer mm -hmm. of both. Um, right. which is probably ideal because you really can then, they impact each other tremendously. So we're seeing, again, many schools do some great things. It's not consistent. Uh, there still are many schools very, very slow to change. Um, so, so, it's a so, so sometimes when you need to change, whether it's, it's like our pandemic, you mentioned earlier, don't waste it, or um, other initiatives, just like being competitive in the world marketplace. Uh, is, there a, is there a broader role? I mean, I, I know... I know what we tried to do with General Motors. I know what you guys at Siemens are trying to do. So we're big industrial companies trying to influence people, right? Um, is there a role for the governments that, that maybe we, they need to play in, in terms of uh, either public policy or even standards? Uh, you know, maybe that's part of the answer, right? To get us off of 50-50 and more to 80-20. Well, I, th I think that's a great point, Craig. And in the countries where we see dramatic change happening, it is from government funded initiatives, putting some attention, putting some money on this and, and doing it consistently across the board. Uh, hmm. We've seen that here and there in, in you know, a place like the U.S., um, but it, it varies by administration quite dramatically. And there's still a lot that we have to do in some parts of the world, to, you know, particularly here, to change the view of how, how they view manufacturing and, and some of these jobs mm -hmm. in the future um, to kind of sell the potential. So, but I think that's a great opportunity and where, where countries are doing that, so many good things happening in, in other parts of the world, uh, that could be good examples for us. So let, let's talk a little bit about manufacturing. Um, you, you know, the, the, the engineers coming out of school, say, say 35 years and younger, they, they get that, that manufacturing will continue to change, right. And change, uh, dramatically probably with things like additive manufacturing and so on. Um, the folks that are 50 and older, uh, you know, they, they've learned over the school of hard knocks how to bend metal, how to remove material, how to even make plastics or, or fiber, of uh, uh, some kind of, uh, of carbon fiber. Um, and so they've got all this experience and, and they become pretty good at it, but, but they're not particularly adaptable anymore. And, and so my question is, is, I think digital technologies, uh, the tools that we have, also the, the ways we can apply them, can open your eyes up to other possibilities. But then it enters uh, an area that you're not experienced in, right? Like, like the guy that knows how to, to do a carbon fiber wing, now all of a sudden has to think about additive. Well, it's, it's completely different, right? And so um, the youngster might be willing to try it because they maybe, if they were really lucky, got exposed in a graduate program, right? Um, do you, do you think the manufacturing is a generational thing? I mean, sometimes I guess you just got to wait for the next generation, but 
But to your point, maybe that's not competitive enough. There, other people are probably going faster, especially if they're new. So I guess my, my question to you is, are, are you guys seeing evidence that us old folks, 50 and older, can adapt to what the youngsters are teaching us? I mean, it's, it, it, is, it is a two-way street, right? We need to listen. Yeah. Um, we're seeing some evidence of that. Uh, but again, outside of, I guess, the traditional university setting, um, seeing uh, places where you can go in and get just nuggets uh, of when you need it and not like a formal schooling program. Uh, but as you were talking about that, Craig, it kind of gave me the idea of what we're saying the schools need to do in these kind of cross-disciplinary mm -hmm. and engineering and business. Can we apply the same in that company, right? So that that older yeah. senior veteran that knows um, has so much history and value that you don't want to lose, but could be teamed up with someone else newer and understands the emerging technologies and collaborate on a project. And maybe it's done, you know, we do things where we kind of have a startup within Siemens, a, a group called Next 47. And, and they're out there pushing all kinds of uh, different ideas um, that are raised up from people within our company. So I think if companies can try to adapt that that startup or that incubator and 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 combine those two levels of talent, we might see some pretty cool innovation. So that was an interesting moniker. Next forty seven is that what you said? Yeah, you did. Okay. Yeah. So what's that? What's it? What's the significance of that? Next forty seven. I, I believe it has to do with uh, when Siemens actually started. Was it 1847? And so oh. you know, looking at the next, I'll have to double check my history on that. But, um, you know, it's it's a group really to try to encourage a lot more innovation within our company. And then they look for opportunity to spin that outside the company. So it's wow. um, in ways, some of what we see some universities doing from these incubators, you know, they develop. You know, it's one of the things I have to remind the Americans that, that listen in where they may not... <laughs> They surely should know about Siemens, but some, a lot of them don't, right? And so you go describing, you know, who Siemens is, and, and I'm like, yeah, how many companies do you know that are over 150 years old? <laughs> I mean, there aren't very many, right? And so, um, yeah, okay, so next 47, I get it, right? Um, like you started on, in 1847, do it again in 2047, okay. I was in an event, one of those virtual events a couple weeks ago, and one of the educators, you know, we're kind of about industry academic collaboration and sort of was dismissing just saying, hey, look, uh, academic institutions are around a whole lot longer than companies. And I, said, <laughs> I begged to differ from my company. Well, I, yeah, you know, I, I, let's go, go back to our, our friend Harvey for a second. So he, he's, got, he's got an interesting title. I, I, I'm envious of it. It's a professor of practice. And he, he's here in Michigan at the University of Michigan, and he's, he's trying to bring, um, you know, what we know in industry and, and kind of what we need. This point about collaboration skills and, and what we just discussed about collaborating across the generation, I, I really think, and, and you're right, now we're all working at home, you, you know, I think you just encourage the youngsters, well, reach out. But I've had a handful of folks, you know, I've, I've been away from the office now almost two years. I have had a handful of folks reach out. They're still at GM and they're in their early 30s, late 20s. And they just, they want to talk to somebody who's, who's got gray hair and experience, but who's also got an open mind that's willing to, to hear what they've got to say about a different technology or a different way of doing something. Um, so maybe, maybe we need to encourage that, not just at the university setting, but also the, the companies. I, I really like your, your point about maybe it's the organizational side of this that we form teams that, that encourage that collaboration. Um, so you've mentioned a couple of times about COVID and, and I'm, I first wanna know, and I think the audience wants to know, well, how are you adjusting? Has this changed your work at all? Uh, dramatically. I mean, I was on the road every other week. Um, cool. And... Then you got all this free time now, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was quite an adjustment, though, when you're used to working mm -hmm. in that paradigm. And, you know, I would work late in the evenings at the hotel so that I'd have more time for my family when I came home. I, I, I'd work on the plane. I fully, um, I fully understand. I was gone 100 nights a year in 18 wow. and 19. And now I've been away from my wife one night since March. And I think she's the one who's like, don't you have a conference to go be the best? Yeah, she, she wants a break, could, right? <laughs> could, you go, could you go please speak for a corporation's team, please? Because I need you to go somewhere. <laughs> and, and that's kind of where we're at. I mean, we're, we're all surviving. We're, we're um, right. fortunate to all be healthy. Uh, but I have two teenage boys. Uh, one's a, a junior and one is a uh, freshman in high school. 
And so, you know, the freshmen didn't get to even go to, to campus and, and meet yeah. any classmates. Everything's all virtual, at least for us, through the end of January. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're all getting a little sick of each other. And we have to have, find ways to um, maintain balance, uh, get some breaks. You know, we put up a badminton court in the backyard and are trying mm -hmm. to do some things differently. We're watching some, you know, shows together, some old shows, even like Cheers, um, just f trying to find some different unique opportunities um, to break out because otherwise, you know, we're all on screens way too long, in school way too long and uh, working way too much. Well, so, so, but you did say earlier, don't waste this opportunity. And, and I think we were talking in the context of digital, embracing digital technologies. So, so um, has that helped? I mean, I mean, I know at, at Siemens, we, we've talked a lot about how we can use your tools to do virtual reviews and virtual uh, experiments. Um, sometimes you still got to get back in the laboratory or somebody has to run the laboratory so you can get a physical test to, to correlate it. Um, what, what has COVID helped uh, accelerate when it comes to digital engineering? Yeah, so I think what's interesting is um, it forced obviously a lot of change so fast last spring. Um, but in talking to educators now, everyone's in a much better place for this fall semester. So having the time really over the summer to look at the lessons learned and try to really set things up more ideally the way you would want them. You know, the challenge we face in the spring is some of the IT people had to go off campus so quickly. You know, you, to your point, you didn't have anybody at the lab to get things set up or even for virtualization. Um, so they got all that kind of fixed and are running uh, much better. But we've seen much more openness to you know, what was interesting is one of the um, educators that was interviewed for that uh, Tech Clarity research talked about using, I think they were using Team Center, Craig, but they were using the PLM tool as the learning management system. They, they leverage, you know, like normally they'd be in the classroom and they could walk around and see where st each student is, although they couldn't necessarily, you know, dive deep. They, they said they were able to dive even deeper because in the PLM tool, they can see exactly what the student's doing, maybe where they're having issues and be able to connect one-on-one -on -one and, and address it. And so they felt an even closer connection than they think they would, you know, would have had in the traditional classroom. So we've seen some creativity that way. Well, that, that's interesting because if, if you go back to when there were drafting boards, which was even before my time, uh, <laughs> you know, the, there was always this collaboration. The, the supervisor lead engineer would look over your shoulder as you were drafting the airfoil or the, or the bracket or the pump or whatever, and, and give you advice, right, about, you know, that angle won't work or, or this, this material strength isn't sufficient for that kind of fillet or, or whatever the topic. So now that professors could interact with the team center um, stored design and actually see progress, I, I, do, I do think that's interesting. I think people need to, to be willing to collaborate that way. We, there was even a, a professor, um, I think Greg has is, is actually moved from from um, out west back here to Purdue where he did his undergraduate. Yeah. And, and, and that's exactly what, what uh, Dr. Jensen was after was teams collaborating. His inspiration was, was the gaming technology. He, he saw his, his sons playing games, these interactive games, and he's like, well, wait a minute. If, if you can all interact in one ecosystem in this virtual world, why can't we do that in, in you know, CAD and, and design tools? And they, they did some pretty impressive things. But... They really emphasize anybody that wants to be a part of the virtual world, interact with a design, could be anywhere. And, right. and now this is what we need for these COVID times is the ability to do that. So interesting. I am I'm quite pleased. I mean, ecstatic that Siemens has got EDA tools under their umbrella. So electronic design automation, for those of you that are just mechanical engineers listening in. And, and then how you bring the EDA world and the mechanical world together, along with all the software that goes in those computers, um, you guys at Siemens are, are doing a pretty good job of bringing that all together. So and then uh, and then add low code on top of that, right, with our Mindex platform. So it's okay. It's, well, then you got to explain <laughs> that, and then we're almost out of time. So all we'll say is faster applications, right? And and Mendix enables that, and we'll we'll let the students. Uh, or the listeners. There's a podcast they can listen to that tells Okay, you. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, and we won't have to repeat it then. So, well, Dora, it's been wonderful chatting with you, and I'm, I'm glad your family is safe. Um, I, I, I do hope we get through this, but I do think what you're encouraging, I, I, I think our listeners should listen uh, 
to your point about COVID's an opportunity to not waste. These, the digital tools exist to, to work, even from your remote home, wherever that may be, um, and still be productive. It, it's been interesting to see software companies, tool companies, and companies that do engineering have done pretty well through the pandemic, right? Our, our only real impact has been when we need to go see a physical test or, or do an evaluation, and then we have a, a limited number of technicians running the lab and we get to see the da data, right? Anyways, it's been great chatting with you. And uh, Tom, you got any last questions for Dora? I do because Dora, a lot of people who listen to this show are, are anxious to grow their careers. And the last eight months has been kind of a weird path for people to figure out what should I be doing to set myself up for that next opportunity and that growth opportunity. So I love it before we let really smart people leave this podcast. I love to ask them, what career advice would you give to people who are listening to this show? So I'm mentoring a, a couple of women in our company right now. And I'll, I was just on with one of them a couple hours ago. And we were talking about like these public speaking opportunities, because I find they're really stretch opportunities for you. I had to talk about artificial intelligence in September at the Grace Hopper conference. I'm not an AI expert, but I had to really then research what Siemens was doing across that space to be able to represent it. So I really encourage people to try to find some stretch opportunities and they're available to you now more than they ever were before, right? There's no physical and distance requirement or cost to travel somewhere. Um, so to leverage your network, put yourself out there and you'll be surprised, I think, at how you develop. So it's interesting you bring up two things. One was, you know, the the speaking opportunities and just communication in general. We had a podcast episode, I think two weeks before this one airs. Sometimes things get out of order, so I don't know. But I think two weeks ago, I interviewed a guy who's, he coaches CEOs on how to give good speeches. And I went back and listened to it. I actually aired it on my podcast on Making Waves at Sea Level because it was such an important message for people at all levels about being able to speak clearly, whether it's a conference or you're just in a meeting with somebody else. So let's talk a second, because you, you talked about like the skills where people felt they were lacking in, in the survey that you referenced. Communications was one of the big skills yeah. where there was lacking. So how can people, yeah, it's a great stretch goal to go give a speech, but what can people do to get ready to go do that? Um, you can practice, <laughs> practice a whole lot. Um, you know, I, I usually spend some time really thinking through what do you want to communicate and, and repeat that, repeat that, repeat that. Um, you, you can do it at a, a less risky level if you want, right? Uh, go speak at uh, my kid's school or, you know, try out some, some messages in an environment that feels uh, safer. Um, like I said, the mentoring relationship, leverage a mentor and just let them hear you out, let them give you advice back. Um, yeah, I think it comes down to just, just practice. Well, and the second piece besides communication skills I was going to pick up on was you said you mentor, you know, two women within your organization. We hear it time and time again, mentorship, 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 but people don't know how to ask or find a mentor. So how did the two women that you mentor find you? Was it a formal program? Was it organic? Yeah, our uh, Siemens has really gotten good at this the last couple of years. And maybe it's because we now have a, a woman EVP, right? That's driving some, some change. Um, and we now um, have a program where anyone can raise their hand, say they want to mentor. Um, and there's a pool of people who have been trained to be mentors that they can pull from. Um, so one of these was kind of formally assigned through a formal program and another one just raised her hand to her manager and, and someone suggested me to, to be her mentor. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it happens many different ways. Um, but I will say I'm, I'm proud of how our company is is developing in that space. Well, cheers to you. I've been working with two smaller, much smaller companies than yours <laughs> about trying to develop a mentor program. And you know, I commend companies that do it, but the problem is you got to make it work. It's got to be done right. So it sounds like you guys are doing something right. So that's good. And you got to have to mix a mix of formal and informal, right? We've got some basic women uh, wins network. We call it an ERG, an employee resource group. Give them a comfortable environment where they can talk openly about issues. And then we've got some more uh, smaller groups that really try to get together and, and dive into some tougher issues. And then we're looking at some more uh, strategic, uh, I would say, uh, professional kind of training to really drive that next level of female executive. I think that's, I think that's awesome. Well, Thank you very much for being here on our show. Any last words for everybody? Just that hopefully you hear our passion, right? I'm really passionate um, about what we're doing to empower the next generation of digital talent. And we're trying to leverage the tough year we've had uh, to drive that forward. And I think we're seeing um, some good opportunities come out of it. That's awesome. Yeah, bravo. Hey, you know, Dora, just thank you. Thanks for the things you guys do. You, you keep reaching out to universities and students. It's really important. And we will come out of this COVID period 
much stronger, all of us. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, so, uh, Tom. Really appreciate it. Oh, appreciate you. Thanks again for being here. And thank you for everybody who tuned in uh, to listen. And I say it every single time. I want you to come back because Craig and I do this every single week. We're going to be here next week with more thoughts, ideas, and information in and around product lifecycle management. The Digital Enterprise Society, it's the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Go check us out right now at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more connection without boundaries and creation without limits.